peace and blessings. This is Misael Bay, aka Warlock Asylum, coming at you once again with another lesson from the Simon Necronomicon. And the last time we uh, left off, we was talking about the Book of Calling, and so now we'll be going into the Magan text. And uh, it's one of my favorite sections of the Necronomicon, and I'm going to pull my screen up for everyone so that we can look a little bit further into this. Okay, it should be coming up now. There we go. So we can all see the Magan text. Uh, this is one of my favorite books, and it gets into some uh, very deep things. Uh, first of all, the text is divided into five sections. So for those who haven't figured that out yet, this is the personification of the arrow sign, the star. And um, it has a lot of good meat and it's kind of essential. Um, it's mentioned that the text should be remembered. Uh, we see in the, the, in the introduction, it says I've copied down uh, those words down in my tongue, kept them faithfully these many years and my own copy will go with me to the place when I go when my spirit is torn from the body. But heed these words well and remember, for remembering is the most important and most potent magic being the memory of things past, memory of things to come, which is the same memory. So in this book, we see um, a timelessness in the Magan text. Um, that's the key thing about it. Um, let me stop share for a second. There's a timelessness when we read the text. It's like a, to, to catch a space that out of, that's out of time. When the book begins, it says that, you know, when it begins with the first section, it talks about time before time. Uh, so remembrance of things that happened in the past, and remembrance of things in the future, keep us in the present. And that's pretty much what the Mad Arab was writing about in that section. Um, but there is a, definitely like a lot of meat I want to approach. So I'm gonna share my screen again, and we can get back into this. Let me just pull this up. And boom, there we go. Okay, so we can see that after that, we get into the beginning of the, the Magan text. And um, unfortunately, what happens a lot is that people look at this and they say, oh, this is a bastardized version of, you know, the Anuma Elish. When actually it isn't. It's really for the practitioner of the Simon Tome. And in the beginning, when it talks about in the name of Enlil, remember, in the name of Anu, remember, in the name of Enlil, remember, in the name of Enki, remember, right away we know that this right here is a conjuration. The beginning of the Magan text, the first chapter, is a conjuration. And it's basically to empower the magician to continue in his work of what he's doing. And it was said <clears throat> during the new year. So that should be honored just like the Illumin, the Numa Elish. Um, of course, it does share some correspondences. There are some commonalities, but <clears throat> what I would say about the first section of the Magan text is that it's something that a person practicing today in the modern world that they can utilize. But make no mistake about it is that the first section of the Magan text is definitely for um, speaking over the Agamasaratu when the Necronomic year changes. So we just want to keep, keep that in mind. Um, it's a rich text. I'm going you know, to be going back and forth between this screen and sharing the screen with the text itself. So let me go back into it again. There we go. So we're back. And we can see the situation with the elder gods, the ancient ones, similar to the Enuma Elish. There's a lot of meat that's being brought forth here. Um, and at different phases of the text, we're being told to remember. You see what I'm saying? Um, basically, you know, what the Magan text, it, it, it definitely has a, a, a right that is um, very essential. 
but it also um, exemplifies the 59 when you really understand it, reading the first part of that text. Uh, later on, it talks about, you know, the generations of the ancient ones. And this is something I want to give attention to because every situation in the Necronomicon is in the Magan text. Uh, the summation of all the deities, the energies, uh, both malevolent and um, beneficial are in the Magan text. And so that's one of the key things. A person should try to remember, you know, the text throughout um, because that kind of shows a purification of sorts. One of the big things is in section three, it talks about the forgotten generations of man and that the fact that he has a lot of um, qualities, he's, you know, his parents are the ancient ones. So he's in a situation, let me stop share, I'll, I'll get back to that. Mankind is in a situation where he's, you know, created from the slain gods. And he's also, um, he also has the breath of life breathed into him by the higher, uh, not the higher, but the younger gods. So he's made of two opposing forces. And, you know, that's a key thing because, you know, mankind is always challenged as far as completing himself. You know, that alchemy of spiritual cultivation is always going to be a challenge. And once again, we see evidence of another covenant. I'm going to share my screen again. Hopefully we can get some uh, understanding on this. And basically it says that I'll read in the, of the Forgotten Generations of Man, section three. And it says, and was not man created from the blood of Kingu, commander of the whores of the ancient ones does not man possess in his spirit the seeds of rebellion against the elder gods. And the blood of man is the blood of vengeance, and the blood of man is the spirit of vengeance, and the power of man is the power of the ancient ones. And this is the covenant. For lo, the elder gods possess the sign by which the powers of the ancient ones are turned back, but man possesses the sign, the shape, and the number. So, What's very interesting about this is that man, in the equation of the ancient ones, in the equation of the elder gods, man is a being that will probably surpass both of them as a race, you know what I'm saying? And within man is a settlement, is, what, is a covenant. And so that's why he possesses the sign and the shape, the number and the shape to summon the blood of his parents. And this is the covenant, this is the DNA. He has a chance to ignite his DNA and it was created by the elder gods from the blood of the ancient ones. All that's talking about is this genetic code. And here's where it starts to change. It says, man is the key by which the gate of Ayaxacoc may be flung open, by which the ancient ones may seek their vengeance upon the face of the earth against the offspring of Marduk. For what is new came from that which is old, and what is old shall replace that which is new. And once again, the ancient ones will rule. So man can definitely, you know, really change some events in the world, but the covenant that they're talking about with the ancient ones and what was new shall replace what is old is talking about the cycles of the seasons. And that's certainly a magical event. It has a deep effect on uh, man's psyche. And if you understand that cycle, that's the same cycle that the practitioner of these sciences is supposed to adhere to. He's supposed to work with certain things during a certain time of year and certain things during another time of year. Let me hit the screen back again. If, many, if any of you have training in other sciences, I know like in some forms of Sufism and in some teachings in Islam and things, they talk about you should 
only eat certain foods at certain times of the year. I think that's also in some comedic sciences as well. And so in the same token, you should honor certain energies at certain times of the year. And that's a very, um, you know, key aspect of the work. It's not so much, to be honest with you, Necronomicon is not really difficult, but a lot of times what happens is because the book is placed in a, like a spoken word, it's very allegorical, you know, depending on your background, you may try to align it with some understanding that you have about something else. The best thing to do is to approach it with the empty cup. Um, the other thing to realize is very multidimensional because people could be working with different parts of the system at different times. And because of that, their viewpoint will be different than someone who's in another region of the text. For example, a person could be, you know, walking the gates, someone could be in the Urilla, Urilla text. And their, you know, their, their interest, their um, perception, what they gain from the system is going to be different because they're in working within two different sections. It doesn't mean that um, there's a conflict because I'm sure if those two people were to flip roles, they would give the same testimony about their experience in a different sector as the person who also experienced. And so that way we know that it's a whole. It's a good thing because, you know, a person could be not found. They may want to you know, go someplace where they're not found astrally or could be not found in, in terms of their scent. And they could do that by working with different points of the gaze. They're very exacting texts and there's a lot of meat in it, you know. Next up is, let me share my screen again, is one of my favorite sections. It's probably out of all the sections, the Magan text, the one I've read the most is of the sleep of Ishtar. Because in the process of that, you know, Ishtar in some ways is the spirit of life, but the term Ishtar, <clears throat> like the term Tara, who she later metamorphosized into or perceived by the Tibetans as being, means star. So what you learn here is that when you kind of start really reading the Magan text, over and over again, you read it as a history, you know what I'm saying? Um, you could, there's a lot of things that you could pull out of it as far as like workings are concerned, ritual workings, but read it as a history because when you read it as a history, you begin to understand certain things about the tome and things about yourself. So when I read of the sleep of Ishtar, you know, I begin to see that, you know, Ishtar is, is, is us in a way, you know, it's the Ara sign. So we know the sign of Enki, but Ishtar is the Ara sign, which is the sign of your race. You are from a race beyond the stars. So that's Ishtar, you know, and you kind of get to see, um, you know, her passing through the seven gates. And, you know, this, this is a very allegorical account, but what I found most interesting in it is that if you can compare the gates, like the first gate that she went through, the second gate, things of that nature with the gates that we walk in that same order, you may see some resemblance. And from that, we know that walking the gates is, is more of a chthonic right than anything else. Um, but it's, there's a lot of jewels in there. Um, you see some sections of the text repeated. For example, from, here's something to consider. Let me just open my screen back up. When you're reading the Magan text and you're reading of the sleep of Ishtar, there's a lot of meat in there. And I'm gonna really try to break this part down because we glossed over some of the other areas really to kind of get to this section. Um, why is Ishtar sleeping? You know what I'm saying? Um, basically, when you look at the Genesis account, the first chapter of Genesis, Right. Let's think about this, for example. Imagine if after we saw this expression, let there be light, right, that we see this force descending down. And as this consciousness is descending down, the place 
or the destination that this consciousness is going to settle is preparing itself to receive this consciousness. If you can flow with that, imagine that. So in Genesis chapter one, we see seven stages of seven days. And finally, when that consciousness settles down in Genesis chapter one, verses 28 and 29, we see, um, we see um, that, you know, the creator of God created um, humanity, male and female, he created them. That's a totally different account than the creation of Adam. It's a totally different account, which comes in chapter two. And if you look at the aesthetics of chapter two, there's no vegetation in the field. And then man was made from the dust of the ground. It's totally different than the first account where vegetation was made. And, you know, they're made multiply and they're told to replenish the earth, which meant that was inhabited before. The reason why I'm saying that is because perhaps that was the Ishtar consciousness descending down into the underworld. And I say that because there's another clue to that. The Mad Arab, he mentions in the Magan text that, you know, he mentions terms like, you know, my spirit's torn away from my body. You know, I, I wish to, you know, go into the realms of Anu, heaven, things of that nature. So when you read the last part of the text and he and it says the dark waters rolled, it sort of makes it seem as if, you know, this guy, he got caught up in some type of rapture or that he left. But when you read the Magan text, you know, when Ishtar awoke, the dark water stirred. It mentioned when she was crucified, the dark water stirred. And when she awoke, the dark water stirred. So we know the term the dark water stirred refers to someone living in the underworld. So if the Mad Arab was writing this stuff while he was on earth, and the dark water stirred, then perhaps in comparison, this is the underworld to that energy that was coming down that consciousness in Genesis chapter one. Something else to consider about Genesis chapter one and of the sleep of Ishtar in comparison. When you look at the creative days, even before the sun and moon was created, it says that there was an evening and a morning. First, why does evening come before morning? That should be an indication of something. But what it illustrates is the morning star, which is, we know, a sign of Ishtar. So Ishtar was closing out the days. That shows us that, it shows us what really was going on in that account on a bigger level, right? And then we look at, you know, the situation with um, Ishtar is called of the sleep of Ishtar. Man is asleep. God rested on the seventh day. Why did man, you know, why did he fall into a state of sin or the fall of man happen at the same time that God rested? I'm sure that you can figure that out. If humanity is using seven to 10% of their brain presently. Some people give it a lower number, 3%. But let's just say between 3 and 10% of his brain. And he can accomplish things where I can communicate, you know, to you at a different time. And you could view it at any time. It's certainly something amazing. But imagine if man had full capacity of his brain and you gave him a period of 7,000 years, let's say each creative day was 7,000 years, and you start today as ground zero. So seven times seven will be 49,000 years. What can man do from this point going 49,000 years into the future? What could he do with full capacity of his brain? I don't know, create a planet or something. I don't know. You see, so this kind of tells the race of man you know, this is what his potential is. And, you know, the, the, the Simon Tome definitely recognizes that as well as ancient Mesopotamian allegory. I'm gonna go back into the text again, share my screen. Finally, we get down to the fifth part of the text. And it says, you know, if a man gives him a warning 
to not to stoop in that place. So I imagine that in this cathartic right, it's not just the reality, but there is definitely a, 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 a section that's not, um, that represents the underworld, that's just not in the day-to-day -day land of the living. You know, but it's kind of interesting that in man's descent or the consciousness that came down in Genesis chapter one, similar to the consciousness that came down, um, you know, when Ishtar went to the underworld, that there was definitely like a lot of similarities, but there's also like another weight. So I would say that the land of the living, based on its emotional constitution, and other things is probably more closer to a force of the underworld than it is to um, the heavenly world. That's something, as it mentions, that man, you know, he, he, he has this situation where he has the blood of the ancient ones pouring through his veins. Then, you know, the society that we live in, all those things is more in tune with that world and at different times it may bend another way but as far as the cycle is concerned there's some things that man hasn't been able to shape but hopefully in the future because i do believe in the destiny of the human race and that we're going through progressive stages to reach a extremely higher form of consciousness as human beings and that's what we created in a way to to emulate that but in the cycle that's mentioned of winter and summer and, and between life and death, there's a lot of different learning lessons. And so as man moves, he learns those lessons. So by the time that he fully graduates as a race, you understand what I'm saying? He would know like completely without a doubt what's inappropriate and appropriate and would just be inclined to deal with the appropriate action. So in the same way that that is, you know, part of the destiny of humanity, on the individual level, we have things to learn and, you know, go through that same cycle in a miniature life, you know what I'm saying? So, you know, based on the conflict, that was the creation of time. When you look into the first section of Magan text, when it talks about time before time and the gods gathering this and that, all that sort of thing started happening. That was the creation of time. And thank God for time because we wouldn't even have time to comprehend our own life if it wasn't for time, if we wasn't in this medium of time. You know, so it's also a school because on some levels, um, it is it is an illusion, but ordinary time isn't. So we want to keep those things in mind. So we'll be back very shortly. I got to catch up on some of the videos because I've been um, just fulfilling other obligations and doing other things that are very exciting as well. And hopefully, I can talk about soon. This is Misael Bay, aka Warlock Asylum, saying good night and Wafu Bay.